All right. Um, thanks, everybody, for coming. Uh, my name is Derek Taylor. I'm the director of the Maryland Robotics Center. Um, I think we'll go ahead and get started with today's speaker. Um, so we are fortunate enough to have Peng Wei, who is an assistant professor at um, George Washington University in the Department of Mechanical and Aerospace Engineering. Just came over from Iowa State, yeah. actually just in the last couple months. Um, and uh, he works at the intersection of control, optimization, machine learning, and AI, primarily with uh, aeronautics and aviation focus, um, as well as robotics. Um, he has a number of applications um, of his research, including air traffic control management, airline operations, UAS traffic management, and what he's going to be talking about today, which is urban air mobility um, in eVTOL aircraft. Um, so his PhD was from Purdue in 2013. He's an associate editor for AIAA Journal of Aerospace Information Systems, and he's on the advisory boards for Airbus and NASA Ames Research Center. So um, thanks again to our sponsors at Lockheed Martin, Applied Technologies Lab, for sponsoring this seminar. And thank you for attending. Please join me in welcoming our speaker. Thank you. Thank you, Derek, for your introduction. And uh, thanks, Anya, and all the colleagues and uh, folks at uh, University of Maryland uh, for your warm welcoming. So I feel uh, uh, pretty uh, good uh, today here. So OK, today my uh, topic is Unlock the Personal Sky, Safe and Short Autonomy for On-Demand Urban Air Mobility. All right, so here is the introduction about my lab. Uh, so the name of my lab is called Intelligent Aerospace System Lab, or IASL. Uh, so we work on modelings and uh, algorithm, algorithms for design and operation uh, of air transportation and avi avionics systems. So some of the methodologies we are using is uh, from control uh, optimization, machine learning, and artificial intelligence. So speaking of artificial intelligence, we do primarily on planning and decision making. Uh, we we did a little bit work in computer vision. Uh, you know uh, that that's about it. But most of the work is in uh, reinforcement learning and deep reinforcement learning for AI. So applications, my uh, traditional or past applications uh, we do is in air traffic control, air traffic management, as well as on uh, airline operations. So I actually worked for American Airlines for a year and a half, so I got to know more how the airline dispatch center works. Uh, so in general, I have uh, you know, pretty good knowledge and experience in aviation side, uh, but some of my new applications are, for example, UAS traffic management. So we are talking about Amazon using, trying to use drones to deliver packages, uh, and we talk about electric uh, vehicle prognostics, so we are building battery models uh, or predictive models to predict the battery re remaining time uh, during the flight. Uh, that's uh, pr pr prognostics. And then today's topic will be urban air mobility. Uh, so you can see first five is all about how do we fly safely. Uh, the last one is uh, how do we fly recklessly. So autonomous drone racing. Uh, Professor Paley is also very passionate and, and uh, actively working on autonomous drone racing. Uh, so this part drove our group a little bit more to the robotic side. Uh, other than that, most of the applications are aeronautics and aviation, but recently we also start to work on uh, vision and decision making and real-time systems. So that's a quick overview. So now let's talk about urban air mobility. So urban air mobility, uh, a lot of uh, companies publish their white paper, or whatever, talk about urban air mobility. The most famous ones are Uber Elevate. Uh, they published back in 2016 or maybe 17, and envisioning this uh, new transportation mode, uh, basically using this uh, vertical takeoff and landing vehicle. Uh, so for example, helicopter is uh, vertical takeoff and landing, but electric propulsion. So uh, you know, speaking of the electricity electrification in cars or automobile industry. Uh, they want to bring the electrification to the aviation industry as well, uh, as well as a short or hopefully certifiable autonomy. So they, like cars, people want autonomous cars. And in aviation, people also thinking about autonomous uh, airplanes. And then those three are kind of the core ideas of urban air mobility, uh, the two grayish um, fonts are not yet, uh, everybody agrees, 
Uh, so people are still talking, should those operations be on demand? Like uh, air taxi type of like uh, Uber, like when you uh, on demand operation or by schedule. By schedule means metro or bus or transit, that services. Or uh, people start to think, oh, should those rights uh, to be ride sharing uh, like Uber? Or personal own, you know, some of the business executive or, uh, you know, they probably want to own those vehicles. Uh, so that's the core idea of urban air mobility. Um, so the goal here, you know, the community is trying to uh, envision a safe, efficient, and affordable transportation mode in the city uh, that can be used by uh, everybody. And the challenges here are actually mentioned in this um, uh, white paper or booklet uh, published by Airbus back in 2018. Uh, so Airbus uh, asked uh, three academic groups uh, to help them with this. Uh, so all three groups are from aviation side. Uh, there is, uh, you know, uh, John Hansman and uh, Hamsa Balakrishnan from MIT, the big aviation group at MIT Ast uh, Aero Astro, and uh, Michael Kogendorfer from uh, Stanford. Uh, they have a, a, group, a great group uh, working on aviation problem, and my group. So we, we contributed to this uh, white paper. The, the challenges we identified are many, but I'm listing four of them. So number one is vehicle challenges. So we talk about vehicle design, I talk about vehicle manufacturing, as well as the avionics. Uh, so you know, when we say autonomy, so a lot of autonomy happens at uh, avionics level. And we also talk about city infrastructure. Are cities uh, ready? You know, if we use smaller drones to deliver packages, not much infrastructure we are talking about. You know, those things can basically land in everybody's backyard or maybe rooftop. Uh, but if we talk about larger vehicles, uh, we need a dedicated uh, space for takeoff and landing. Uh, so that's the uh, infrastructure side. Of course, you know, when we use electric propulsion, are the power grids ready? What's the interplay between those uh, fleet dispatch, the charging, discharging, and also the, the power grid? That's also infrastructure. And then uh, the next challenge it will be uh, policy and regulation. So is, is the FAA ready uh, for those type of vehicle and for those type of uh, air traffic control mode? And then my group's focus is on operations. Uh, so we have been always focused on how to make operations safe, efficient, which means uh, less delay, and also scalable. And also we want to develop some you know, models or simulation results trying to support the policy and the regulation making. So, when, so a quick example, say, if FAA or a certain agency want to define a safety density in a certain airspace, you know, if, so for example, if I, we have University of Maryland uh, map, and how do we define the, the upper limit uh, number of drones can, can be operated at University of Maryland to be 50, to be 100, to be 150, where that number comes from. So we will use, we will develop algorithm at the same time, you know, run simulations against different algorithm, against different concept of operations, and then support you know, the decision, making, uh, decision makers and, and, and regulation makers. So that's uh, my group's focus. A little bit more about my group. Uh, so some of the research on urban air mobility going in my group. Uh, the first uh, cluster of my research is on arrival management. So why do we want to focus on arrival management? Because uh, usually in aviation or in aeronautics, arrival is the most challenging part because of in the terminal region, or you, once you get closer to airport, your traffic density is higher. But when you en route or already in the air, the density low is lower, but when you competing to the limited resource, which is runway or airport, in this case is landing pad, you know, the density become higher. At the same time, this uh, electric vehicles has very limited power, I mean, limited uh, battery power. So when the, most of them on the market, uh, I mean, the, the commercial ones, or uh, they can fly 20 minutes, 30 minutes. Uh, if they carry a payload, I mean, their flight time is pretty limited. So then we need, when they got to the arrival, so that's the most critical phase of flight. And then under this line of work, uh, we do some optimal control. 
uh, to calculate the uh, you know energy efficient arrival trajectory, and we do some online prediction of battery discharge or battery remaining time, and we also do some arrival scheduling. So that's this line of work. Of course, so a lot of arrival um, problems can be um, or arrival uh, uh, management techniques can be used on departure as well. So we have now we have uh, departure and arrival. But you know what challenges we are having for en route. So the first part is vehicle to vehicle uh, interaction or vehicle to vehicle reaction. So we call this collision avoidance. Uh, so in this line of work, we are dealing with a free flight operation. So if you see on this map, there's no specific routes or intersections or waypoints in this map. So this is mimicking a, a, a pedestrian or human, uh, you know, walking zone. That how can, you know, with a vehicle walking or, or traveling in this room to each destination without colliding each, to each other. So that's one theme we are working on. Uh, the next we are working on is also en route, but we call this autonomous uh, ATC or autonomous air traffic control. So actually when we take flights for travel, there's a lot of guys actually looking after our you know, uh, flights. When we take American Airlines or United Airlines, of course, on board we have pilots, but the pilot company also have dispatch, dispatchers to watch for our uh, vehicles. And the most critical people is air traffic controllers. So they are usually sitting in a very dark room and watching at his or her uh, radar screen and watch the movements of all the aircraft. And their task is really to, to give the commands, or we call it advisories, to change the speed, adjust the speed of each vehicle, and do not let the vehicle crash into each other. Uh, of course, when you go to the airport or clo get closer to the airport, they not only adjust the speed, so sometimes they will, do some, uh, will ask pilot to do some airborne holding, to do some vectoring, to do some other maneuvers. But in en route airspace, when we do a level flight in the air, most of their job is trying to uh, figure out the speed adjustments. So in this work, we develop some reinforcement learning and try to play this game. This, this uh, screen actually is a computer game uh, published by NASA. This game is called NASA's, NASA Sector 33. So if you want to try it, uh, you know, please download this game and try it, NASA Sector 33. So in this game, we are trying to control three or two aircraft, and you know, all of them are trying to go through this merging point. Uh, so as the air traffic controller, uh, you know, the video player's job is to adjust the speed as well as change the route. So we develop an agent that can, you know, play this game. So we hope it can support human air traffic controller uh, to do their job. But in this talk, we will actually combine some idea between this. Because when we do this work, we find out, oh, we can do two aircraft, three aircraft. But when we have more aircraft, the centralized algorithm cannot scale. So we kind of use the distribute behavior from this work, uh, but work on a uh, structured airspace. Uh, we will see that later. All right, the fourth stream of work is uh, airspace management. Uh, so for example, we work on pre-departure flight uh, plan coordination. We want to balance the demand and capacity. We also want to uh, manage uh, strategically the traffic uh, and also demand and supply. So that's that. Uh, so all the first four are the FAA side of work, or air traffic control, air traffic management work. The last piece is, uh, is uh, operator side, or fleet side. So we want to work on fleet management, uh, fleet dispatch, for example, are we running this operation on demand or by schedule? Uh, you know, how about, how do we forecast the demand model? and how do we uh, design the network scheduling and real-time dispatch algorithms. So those are some uh, themes uh, going on in my lab. Uh, so today we'll talk about this two, or sort of combine this two. Okay, let's see. All right, so on the left-hand side is actually a structured airspace. Uh, we have run one uh, route going on here, one route going on here, and one route going from north to south. We actually have three different routes. 
uh, and we have two intersections, uh, one intersection here, one intersection here. It's kind of like when you walk on UMD campus, uh, you have some paths, and how you know all the students walk on its individual paths, how can you manage not to crash each other at the intersections? So this is one theme. The other theme is this free flight. We don't have any airspace structure. It's a pure like uh, uh, pedestrian walking uh, theme, uh, walking a crowded mall or crowded space. Uh, you know, you can see all the red guys are crashing, so don't worry about them. And if you look at the yellow guy, it can calculate the next decision, you know, in real time. Uh, at the same time, reach to the destination, which is a uh, green star. So that's uh, structured airspace versus uh, free flight. So today we'll focus on the first one, and then we'll do it distributedly. So the research problem here is, can we design a real-time distributed conflict resolution algorithm to enable autonomous air traffic control in a structured en route airspace? OK, so what is the state of art, or what has been done in industry, as well as in um, you know, literature? So related work, collision avoidance and conflict resolution in industry. So in the commercial jets we are taking every day, every, v every uh, aircraft is equipped a system called TCAS, uh, Traffic Alert and Collision Avoidance System. This system was developed by MIT Lincoln Lab. So this system actually is the last layer of protection of two aircraft, you know, of aircraft crash. So it is air to air or vehicle to vehicle, and this handles one to one. And this is the last layer of defense against mid air collision. And this system usually, you know, will be triggered 15 to 35 seconds before crash because they will use some, uh, you know, um, uh, the, the, uh, the radar beacon to figure out. Uh, you know, the, 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 the crash time. And then this system only will suggest vertical maneuvers to avoid the crash. So then we have the second system. So this is a rule-based system, basically. So uh, MIT Lincoln Lab almost enumerate all types of uh, collision possibility, and then they develop a rule-based lookup table. Say if you are in this situation, the two aircraft should do this. If you in that situation, the two aircraft should do that. Then we have this ACAS X model. So they use same cockpit display and same hardware on the aircraft, but different advisory logic. So in TCAS, we have fixed rules or lookup table, sort of. And now we have probabilistic model. So it's basically solving an MDP or a POM DP with discrete state space offline. So, and then implement the policy to the onboard uh, aircraft system. So why people look at this probabilistic model? Because the first system, you know, a rule-based model, looks like it's, it's trivial, it's, it's safe, it's deterministic. But the problem is if two aircraft are approaching, if the system asks one guy to climb, one guy to descend, no problem. If both pilots follow the instruction, no problem. But tragedy had, had happened in Switzerland when the system you know, suggests one pilot to climb, one pilot to crash. And then the air traffic controller, remember the guy sitting in the dark room watching the, the, the radar screen? The guy suggests one guy, the opposite. And then the, 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 the end is uh, one pilot listened to the system and he climbed. And one guy listened to the ATC. So both climbed and then crashed. So, so the probabilistic model exists because not necessarily we have non-cooperative -co flights, but also what if there is some mistake from the pilot, even the late response from the pilot, or we have non-cooperatives, then we need to rely on probabilistic model. Okay, those two are both onboard uh, you know, systems. And the last part is a ground-based system. It's called auto-resolver and T-safe. This is a ground-based centralized system. And this system is look at conflict resolution. So what's the difference between collision avoidance and conflict resolution? So in, in a simple way to put is collision avoidance is to avoid mid-air collision. So it's absolutely almost crash and let's avoid. But conflict is still far away. Because 
it could be 35 seconds to eight minutes before crash, and it kind of predict there will be a potential conflict, and then we will resolve that. So conflict resolution meaning we want to prevent loss of separation. So that's that. So in in our system, we'll draw some you know, features from all three systems. Number one, we handle air-to-air -air or vehicle-to-vehicle. -vehicle. Number two, our algorithm will be a probabilistic model. And number three, we actually work on to prevent loss of separation. Uh, because the collision avoidance is handled by this system pretty well, so we'll do a further layer of protection, which is prevent loss of separation. All right, so reinforcement learning, so we'll do uh, this work in a reinforcement learning uh, fashion. So, uh, the, so how about reinforcement learning in air traffic control and air, air traffic management? Uh, not so much work has been done. In air traffic flow management, uh, you know, remember we say we want to balance uh, demand and supply even before departure. Uh, so that's flow management. So there are MDP work from Stanford. There's a uh, multi-arm band-aid from uh, University of Maryland here. And then we have uh, air traffic control. So real-time air traffic control or tactical air traffic control uh, from my group. Uh, we did both speed and route advisory in en route. But today we'll talk about uh, speed of advisory only. All right, so our approach, uh, our plan is to formulate this problem as a multi-agent reinforcement learning and solve it using actor, uh, advantage actor critique or A2C. So an overview of about this A2C is, this is a policy gradient method. So if you are familiar with RL uh, literature, so RL are usually in, you know, roughly we have uh, two categories of uh, solution. One solution focus on value-based method. So we're talking about DQN and all the variants from DQN and Rainbow, that's, I guess, the state of art. Uh, maybe the state of art is distributional whatever rainbow, but yeah, so that's a value-based method. On the other side, we have policy-based method. So this is a policy-based method, or actually, actually, it's sort of combined both. But there's an actor to update the policy and select the action, which is sitting here, to search in the policy space, and there is a critique sitting on here to constantly give some idea to evaluate how good the current state is. And then the the traditionally, there's a vanilla actor critique, and then people come up with this advantage actor critique. They introduce this advantage concept to st stabilize the learning. And then we have uh, multi-agent reinforcement learning. So in, in a lot of cases, multi-agent reinforcement learning are trying to achieve the same goal. Uh, but in stochastic games, usually people have multiple agents are competing. Uh, in this work, we have multiple agents are cooperative. And we will implement it as a centralized learning, but decentralized or distributed execution. I'll show you the structure later. Uh, the problem scope and assumptions. Uh, so to make our life easier, we are solving a very simplified problem. So first of all, all the aircraft stay on their own route. Uh, so actually, this is somewhat true. So in the en route space, most of the aircraft will stay on its own route. It's rarely will deviate it. Um, so air traffic controllers will only ask them to, to do the speed uh, uh, adjustments. Uh, and then second, aircraft randomly enter their routes. Uh, so the arrival process is random. Of course, random in a range. Uh, of course, not crazy random. And then number three, we work on two-dimensional airspace. Again, in uh, current commercial jets world, it is also true because in uh, in uh, 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 root airspace, we divide the whole airspace into flat levels, and usually we are dealing with a two-dimensional uh, airspace model. All right, so this is actually a sector. Uh, we simulated in this new simulator called Blue Sky. This is uh, one of the best open source uh, air traffic simulator in the world, developed by TU Delft. Uh, so this is our simulator, and this is our setup. Uh, we have one route uh, goes from right to left on the bottom. We have one route goes from left to right on the top. And then we have uh, the third route goes to from north to south. And we are forming two intersections here. So those two intersections are how we are going to 
handle the, the crashes. Of course, we need to watch out the, the crashes or, 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 or uh, conflict along the route, right? So we, I cannot crash into the, the aircraft or the car in front of me. But now we also need to handle the intersections. So if we do a quick reflection how the intersections are handled in the ground traffic. So we have stop signs, we have traffic lights, and then if you are familiar with AI literature, we have Professor Peter Stone out of uh, UT Austin. So he has some um, autonomous intersection management. Uh, so you will see that, um, you know, if you're interested, you can take a look at it. Uh, but that's uh, based on agent-based formulation, not really on learning or anything. Um, okay, so that's our problem set up. So multi-agent reinforcement learning formulation. Uh, so we have in, in reinforcement learning, we have a couple of uh, key components. The first one is state. Uh, so state is in here. State we include the information of the ownership. So those are the information of ownership. Where, for example, we have distance to the goal. Here, the goal means the exit point of this sector. We have the speed of ownership, acceleration. We have distance to the next uh, intersection. We have a, you know, and so on. We have a safe, uh, we have a definition of the safe range. So for example, this is a kind of safe range we define. So we summarize all the state information of the ownership as this orange SO. And we do the same for the other intruders. So in this case, we want to handle K K closest intruders or my neighbor aircraft. So we'll see, you know, this actually is pretty limited. Uh, so why? Uh, because if this airspace is really busy, you know, if I only look, if K is three, in this case, if K is three, if this airspace really high density is really busy, only look at the nearest three may not be enough, right? But on the other side, if this airspace really sparse, I mean, not much traffic, I don't really need to look nearest three. I may only need to look at the nearest one, or I mean, as long as nobody within a certain distance, maybe I don't need to worry about anyone. So how can we make the change from K, K closest neighbor or K closest intruder to a variable number of intruders? We'll see that later. So that's an uh, interesting part as well. I will, I, I will make sure I highlight. Um, so here the action is we're just doing the speed adjustments. Uh, we can speed up, speed down, and then we hold the current speed. Are the intruders speeding up and slowing down too, or is it just the own ship? All of them. So we'll train one neural network and deplo deploy this neural network to everybody. So they, they have the same decision-making logic. Are there, are there like rules of the road that you know, like in, in maritime, for example, right. there's rules of the road, you know, that certain certain um, configurations, you know, you know to yield. I guess the same in automobiles, like in certain countries when you get on a, a rotary, you know, like a circle, traffic circle, yeah. you know, the cars on the circle might yield or the cars that are not on the circle might, you know, there's rules of the road with right. regard to who should speed up and who should slow down. Right, Is there right. anything like that in air traffic management? In air traffic management, yes. So for example, we talk about general aviation or small personal aircraft. When they kind of kind of approach it to each other, the rule of road is both of them go right. Mm -hmm. But in this problem, we didn't enforce rules of the road. But I guess we did enforce, which is everybody stay on its own route. That's kind of rule of road, uh, rule of road. But other than that, in this problem, we didn't enforce who should yield, who should not. Like, so for example, if like both of us walk in uh, on the campus of UMD, and both of us are going to teach a class, and with all the students walking in those three um, uh, paths, I mean, how can I enforce rule of road? Can I say you are a professor? I should yield you, or maybe not. Maybe. There are some, like, I don't know, something going on. Like, I can tell your, I can estimate your arrival time to this intersection, and I relatively speed up or slow down. Or I can, I don't know, I don't know. There is something goes on there. Uh, yeah, go ahead. Uh, how did you come up with the variables to describe the steady space? Like, uh, why 
this choice of variables here? Right, uh, I think we also tried other things, uh, but looks like those things are pretty, uh, you know, critical ones. So we just pick those three. Not, not much reason here, I guess. Okay, because I know from my research, we're coming up with variables to describe the state is not a very trivial task. So it's agree. tricky to pick up the variable. Agree, agree. I, I think in this problem, this simplified problem, uh, this uh, physical states, uh, state variables are pretty, I guess I would say intuitive. Uh, there are more than this. We tried uh, different combinations and uh, finally those guys are uh, you know, working the best, so we just picked them. Okay, yeah. and when you say working the best, uh, did you use some metric to just like what's working best and what is not? Right, we do have the final results. Uh, the re we basically goes on to all the final results and see if we add extra, if the final results will perform better. If not, you know, we don't add them. So that type of thing. Yeah. Yeah, go ahead. That's a quick question. Uh, I was wondering, you said the uh, learning is centralized. Right. So you learn a policy and right. then you up upload that policy to your agents. Right, right, right. And uh, so I was wondering, because then, because everybody's learning, the environment won't be a stationary. I see your point. I see your point. So we actually will learn first, and then deploy later. So it's not a like a continuous learning. So we will learn through a lot of simulation scenarios, and then we say, oh, you will see the curve. Well, some some at certain threshold, we say, oh, that's converged. Then stop learning, and then. Deploy. When we deploy, they will not learn. I, I guess my question is this: When you deploy it to your agent, right? Your agent won't be able to have uh, all of those states. It doesn't know S sub i or S super subscript i. Oh, okay. Right? From his perspective, it's hmm. partial observable. Uh, Unless you're assuming that agent knows everything about the word and knows the state of the environment and uh, I see your point. everything about the action of the other agents, that makes it basically back, maps it back to MDP. But right, right, right. If you don't assume that, then you have non stationarity in your environment. I see your point. I see your I'm point. Not sure how you're dealing with good, good point. We we did assume we will. So if we are this, we do assume we know the other things. But in this case. None of them are action. So most of them are states. So none of them are flight intention or actions. So I mean, those things, I guess, is relatively easy to know. Because for example, the current speed, the current acceleration, I mean, the distance to the next intersection, I mean, they are relatively to know, I guess. Uh, yeah. But still, like, if back up in my, my mind, uh, I'm thinking like even if I know the state mm. completely, right, right. the fact that I don't know what action the other agents will perform still make the environment on a station. Correct, correct. So there there will be we when we did this research, actually we'll show that when we did the other research. So this guy. If we deploy this algorithm to everyone, so there will be some you know, circular decisions going on there. But somehow through this result, uh, the result actually is pretty good. Um, so I guess, so for example, back to the campus walking example, there's something going on that we can sort of infer what the other guys are doing and try to make our own decision. Yeah, exactly. The, it becomes a palm DP, you should have a belief on the the other guy. That they're gonna make. If you know he's gonna like run, right. probably I'm not gonna run because we're gonna bump to each other. But right, right, right. I can look at him and be like, okay, this guy's not gonna run. It right, 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 right. So agree, agree. So so some of our work do have the inference of other guys' intention or behavior, but the other so including this work and the other side of work, we 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 tested those information will be good enough for, because uh, we are only dealing with conflict resolution. So technically, we are still pretty far away from the crash. So w let's see the reward function. So here, uh, like if they are within three nautical miles, 
the punishing starts. I mean, even before that, even in between, there will be some negative reward going. So it will kind of propelling, uh, I mean, pushing away the dangerous uh, behaviors. So I guess we are, we agree. I think technically, pre to precise solve this problem, we should factor in other guys' intention, or at least near-term intention, or, in or inference other guys' decision making. But in this case, because we are still far away and we have uh, enough buffer, so I guess uh, at the end it works pretty well in this problem. Yeah. Uh, just a quick question in your simulation, like right. the airplanes. Right. Uh, the, the yellow guy. Oh, right, right, right. Your agent, yes. Uh, his mass, uh, his max speed is the same as the, uh, the, the other guys. Yes, yes, this is. Yes, I believe so. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, we'll see that. We'll revisit that later. Okay, uh, multi-agent RL. So here, how do we define episode? One episode is one entire play through the simulation environment. Uh, so this uh, so this episode will end at all aircraft meet their uh, terminal states. Uh, so what are the terminal states then? So uh, the first one is the aircraft reaches conflict state, uh, which is less than three nautical miles, I think. Uh, the other one is uh, aircraft reaches goal state, uh, which is the aircraft exit the sector or exit this uh, its route. Uh, so this is the so-called uh, centralized learning and decentralized execution. Uh, so centralized learning is our neural net. So only one neural network is learned, and then some weights are same weights are distributed to all aircraft, or basically one neural network is distributed to all aircraft. And this reduces the total number of parameters because we are only training one neural network. So if when we do training, we'll have the outer box here where we will have the critique actually evaluate the Q state, evaluate uh, how good a uh, uh, state action state, I guess, as a state. But then when we deploy, they will not have critique anymore, so those are just all actors. Uh, those are just only the policy left. So here is the advantage actor critique. It works pretty well in uh, multi-agent RL, and we, we use this PPO called uh, proximal uh, policy optimization to st further stabilize uh, learning. All right, so this is a deep learning architecture, not so deep, but neural network architecture for uh, multi-agent RL plus A to C. Uh, so remember this SO is all the information I have in the own ship. So I'll pass this SO to here. And this is uh, all the intruder information. I'll pass this to an uh, encoder. And this encoder will give me, you know, possibly a shorter length of, uh, of vector. And then I pass the entire, you know, kind of modified state uh, vector through two layers of fully connected layers. And then I output, uh, first I output V, uh, which is the estimate value from critique. And then I'll uh, output this policy, which is the uh, updated policy from actor. And then remember we had a discussion that currently we work on K closest neighbor or K closest um, intruders. But a lot of time we need to handle variable number of intruders. So how do we do that? So I think uh, you know there's a literature, at least the literature I saw from my colleague Jonathan Hall from MIT. Their paper basically replaced this portion to a SLT, a SLT you know, short long-term, uh, long short-term memory, so LLSTM. And also our group further replaced this with uh, attention. So so we compare this configuration. LSTM attention. So basically the LSTM and attention can compress this variable number. So, so remember this can be three, this can be four, can be five, can be six. But if we have a LSTM or attention, the result will always be fixed length. So in this case, you know, we you know we can handle a variable number of intruder here. All right, so further about the, this case study. So this is one en route sector. There are three routes, uh, two intersections. Uh, 30 aircraft randomly enter the sector. OK, so let me back up a little bit. So human air traffic controllers usually handle 8 to 20 aircraft in this sector. 
so their limitation is cognitive. So it's, it's not really the physical limitation. So if we talk about physical limitation, is the the you know the trail after each um, aircraft, right? So the the turbulence after each uh, uh, the tail of each aircraft. That's a physical limitation. So our colleague John Shorto at George Mason had a lot of work in that. So. But then, why human can only handle eight to twenty? That's because that that's uh, human capability. But you know, our system here can handle thirty in this case, and we define this so-called optimal solutions. All thirty aircraft exit the sector without any loss of separations. That's so-called optimal. So, yeah, go ahead. Uh, do you assume that the agents in the system are acting in an altruistic sense so that the system goal is optimized, or do they have a component in which they can be acting in their own self-interest? Because you might have pathological cases where one aircraft is just traveling at half the velocity so that the other aircrafts can keep passing by, and it wouldn't be fair to the passengers traveling in that particular aircraft. I see, I see. So I think we'll touch on that in the other case. So some uh, you know, cases, the aircraft have some priority like uh, medical or, or, or law, law enforcement. So we can give some uh, priority to other aircraft, but in this case, as we mentioned, just one neural network can deploy to all, so yeah. I guess another way to ask the same question is that on the previous slide, you said the optimal solution is that each aircraft reached its, its goal by exiting the sector, but right, right, it right. could be uh, <clears throat> like a temporal component of that. I mean, you may want to do that in minimum time, for example, right, 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 right. which cool. then might lead to more complex, whereas if you, did, if you didn't include that, then they all could kind of just go extremely Slow. slowly, perhaps. Right, right, right. And somehow, so there's like... Did, so did you address the temporal component? No. So, so, uh, so in real world, the air traffic controller only worries about the conflicts. So they don't in a one sector they don't necessarily will consider the minimum time. Uh -huh. But yeah, there but there I should be some work can be done. Be like a minimum and maximum flight speed. Oh, there will be. Sorry, yeah. I forgot. Yeah. There is there is, is a limitation of. Maximum uh, and, and uh, uh, minimum flight speed. That, that constraint sort of addresses it, I think. Yeah, the constraint is there. I forgot to mention. Yeah. Uh, okay. So this is the results. I guess uh, uh, this blue curve shows the goals. So basically, how many aircraft ar ar arrived to their goals, and then the green line is, of course, we have 30 aircraft. The best result is all 30 uh, arrives. And then this is a conflict. We see the number of conflicts kind of decreased uh, to zero. Still some noises there, but... And then the convergence is achieved in about 20K episodes, uh, which equates to two days of training. Uh, further on this results, validation of converged model. So we have a converged model. So we take a lot of training. We, have a conver we believe that's converged. And we take that model to 20, uh, 200 new episodes. Uh, those are the results. The media results is all 30 aircraft arrived. Uh, their mean is 29.99, which means one out of 200 scenarios didn't give the optimal solution. Uh, we, uh, we, we didn't look into that, but we, uh, we are thinking maybe some, uh, some issue happened in our algorithm or in that scenario, there, there won't be an optimal solution, or so-called optimal solution. All right, so that's that. We already see how it works in action. But now, the other structure airspace can, can have is this merging behavior. So two routes. Let's see. Right. Oh. Two routes merging to one. Yeah, here we go. So there are two routes merging to one, and how do we um, control the speed and make sure the merging is uh, safe? So that's that. All right, so summary, we propose the real-time distributed conflict resolution algorithm. Why distributed? Now, now it's like one human ATC control every aircraft in this sector. The reason we want it to be distributed is for scalability. So uh, real-time distributed conf uh, conflict resolution algorithm. 
And then we formulated this problem as a multi-agent reinforcement learning, and we solved it using uh, A2C and also PPO. Uh, we use this centralized learning to accumulate training knowledge, but we distributed this, uh, you know, we, we uh, implement this in a distributed way uh, for operational scalability. And the simulation, uh, initial simulation results show that this algorithm is kind of promising to prevent at least loss of separation in a small scale use case, uh, but for high density air traffic. So at the end of the day, you right. produced a policy. Mm -hmm that takes into account the three or four nearest neighbors. Right. Or There's many. However many you decide. Right, right, right. And their state vector. Right. And it outputs an action oh. for the own ship. Yeah. And that policy achieved the good results that you, you indicated here. But my question is, like, how might you... You haven't shown us the policy. So how oh, might you tell us the outcome of the learning and how might it compare to like a first principles policy that might be based on, say, rules of the road or some other heuristics? I see, I see, I see. And also, you know, can you speak to the uniqueness of this policy? There may be many policies mm. for which you achieve the same performance. Mm. So can you tell us more about the policy that came out, its uniqueness, and whether there's any intuition that can be arrived at by looking at it? We cannot. <laughs> <laughs> this is the output from, so I guess I, this is, um, the research we want to continue to do, like once we have a solution, once we have a policy, especially this policy is spit out from a neural network, can we say something about its temporal optimality? Can we say something about you know the verification part, the safety? Are, is this real, really safe? Or can we say the uniqueness? We cannot at this stage. We know. So right now it's a black box. You right. You take the states of your neighbors and right. output to action. Right. But the question is, how do you even encode that? How is the policy described? Is it? Oh, I see. The policy is described as by looking at all those inputs. The outputs here is basically looking at the entire state vector and uh, so this is my action available three actions and then the policy will be uh, the the output policy will be yeah 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 okay yeah go ahead please maybe I, did, I missed the basic point but how is it different from a simple collision avoidance problem? how is it different with what a simple collision avoidance a simple collision avoidance problem maybe you have an aircraft and just move away from your nearest aircraft. Just a simple, like a simple policy. Will it not work? I see. I think actually, so we show, so in our other lines of work, we showed the similar uh, thought. is kind of like a potential field algorithm. Like when we move closer to other aircraft, we move away. So in that case, we don't have a structured airspace. We have a 3D like free flight uh, airspace. And then we kind of, when we get close, we move away. That simple thought actually worked. Actually, in, in, in a lot of our simulation, it worked. Okay. Uh, but yeah so, yeah, so maybe this will also work. Like when we feel like we are too close to the other guy, we should slow down. I guess what he's maybe saying is how would this compare to like a naive strategy? Right, right, right. But if the optimality is simply that all 30 aircraft reach their goal, right. then there's not, that, that's not a sufficient metric to actually compare Agree. Um, different algorithms that all, you may have multiple algorithms that satisfy the optimal solution. Agree, so agree. You need another metric to actually compare within that family, which might include a naive true. algorithm. True, true, true. I, I think we should do more benchmarking, for example, just a naive policy and see how those two compares. And then not only say, oh, all 30 arrives, that's good, but also some other metrics to measure that. Yeah, good point. Yeah, well, please. Notwithstanding the temporal issue, which of course is important in practice, I mean, it does seem that you, you, you hinted at a metric, right. which was the fact that you know, out of 200 runs, right, 199 mm. of them were Work. safe. Right, right, right. Conflict, right. Right. So that could be one way of comparing algorithms. Mm, uh, right. What I wanted to ask you was, have you thought about a policy mm. that is really a um, 
a composite of multiple policies hmm. where the agents switch between policies. I see. Be based on something about the state that's going on. That's pretty interesting, kind of hybrid system stuff. Uh, we never thought about that. We probably will try that. Maybe yeah. We can talk about it later. Yeah, yeah, sure, sure, sure. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah, thank you, sir. All right, so I'm not done yet. <laughs> <laughs> Let's see, still curious about fly, uh, free flight operations, the stuff I showed in parallel with that. So somehow mimic a pedestrian walking scenario. All those red guys are crashing, but this yellow guy somehow uh, stays safe. Can this scale to multiple aircraft? If we implement this algorithm to multiple aircraft, can it work? Sort of worked for 20 to 30 aircraft, I guess in this case it's 10 or close to 10. And then let's go back to today's topic, urban air mobility. So this is a mock-up for New York City where we have seven uh, vertiports or mini airport. And those are the, you know, in action, they are taking off and departure at the, uh, you know, airport. And then I guess when I talk about this in uh, NYU and my colleagues there say, you know, in NYC, I, I don't mind those vehicles fly slow. But how come I only have, I guess, less than, fewer than 20 aircraft? That's not enough capacity to, to, supp to supply the passengers. You know, my argument is, first of all, those vehicles are actually flying at pretty high speed. You know, one thing is we can slow them down. The other thing is, this is only a 2D. I mean, we have layer of uh, airspace in NYC, so we can potentially have uh, uh, more uh, capacity there. All right, so about that, not also really scalable because this algorithm is uh, it's not really uh, true distributed uh, so it still have some centralized uh, components so that cannot scale too much so we actually separate the airspace into uh, like a honeybee uh, hive so that inside each sector uh, we actually run this distributed so-called quote distributed algorithms, and then um, in this case, we can achieve some sort of scalability. Uh, so this is done by Monte Carlo Tree Search, so no, no uh, learning there. So just uh, online simulation-based Monte Carlo Tree Search. Uh, as, uh, I guess, AlphaGo, they use uh, Monte Carlo Tree Search as well. All right, so here is uh, fly testing. So my group, traditionally, we don't do a lot of hardware. So this is a very small project uh, with a master's student and two undergrads. Uh, we had an autonomous racing platform. Uh, so we have some uh, perception uh, function there. We have some decision-making function there. But uh, there's nowhere near we are in a racing help, uh, you know, conversation. We are flying pretty slow in an indoor uh, environment, uh, but uh, uh, vo slowly avoiding a trash can, that's about it. But we don't use Wicom camera or anything else. <coughs> uh, so I also work in uh, uh, UAS traffic management world. Uh, so for example, this is back in 2016. Uh, so this is PK from NASA. Uh, he is always advocating for uh, you know, UAS traffic management or UTM and also urban air mobility. This is a Sean Cassidy guy who might come here already uh, from Amazon Prime Air. Um, Professor John Hansman from MIT and myself. And that's all I have for today. Thank you very much. <laughs> OK, we've got time for questions. Yes. Um, when you do Please. the um, racing drones, is that sense and avoid, or is that like a pre-planned flight path? We want to do. We don't know. We we haven't you know, really started yet. We have a clumsy hardware. We haven't. But in my plan, I want to do sense and void, or or maybe combine. Because if there is no competitors, but just by myself, I want to create the best lap time. I mean, I just you know offline calculate the best uh, trajectory, and then I follow that trajectory. But in real time, my competitors are trying to do this and that, and I may try to avoid my competitors, and sometimes I may, like I watch F1, 
So sometimes I may purposely stay in front of him to block him. So that dynamic, I don't think we can do it offline. So there is somewhat real-time perception and, and decision-making there. So, and all, all happens, both decision-making and perception happens in real-time. I don't even know um, we can do that in a small platform yet. So, yeah. I am, we, we don't do anything in perception or computer vision, so we cannot say like how achievable that is. I think Professor Paley maybe have more idea and, and uh, Giannis. Uh, has a better idea in that. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah, please. In the aerospace UAM world, how open are people to having uh, things that are learned from RL or other types of techniques? Right, right, right. Into right, right, true. So, the gap between where we are right now and where some stakeholder will actually be willing to put it in. Right, right. So, Traditionally or currently, it's impossible because current FAA uh, regulations and certification is built on uh, rule-based or deterministic uh, verification. So if we move to learning, we basically say we have a bunch of data, we have, we have a bunch of simulations, and some abstraction is learned from the data. So something is embedded in the data, that verification cannot be done. So in that case, I mean, so current regulation is not possible, but people are still open. So I talked to my former master's colleagues. There are general three ways to do this. The first way is I have a learned policy. I deploy, and then I, I, deploy, I implement another uh, real-time safety guard. Basically, if I speed out policy which is not safe, then it say, oh, this is not safe. Go back and resort to a safer action. So that's one way, and former master's people call this uh, I guess online synthesizer or you know online verification, whatever they call. And then another group of people, like almost also form method people, say, let's formally verify this, which is not really possible. I mean, usually the formal methods rigorous math can be done in discrete state space, discrete action space, and both of them in pretty like small cases. And when we see that, that's a continuous action space, I mean, discrete action space, but continuous state space. But I guess most aviation are continuous state space, continuous uh, action space, just like optimal control. Uh, so to, to prove that is impossible. Plus, we have a black box neural network there. So, but I, ha I have seen some work going on from you know, Stanford. They verify some neural network behavior. They call that work. Reloopplex. So that paper was back in 2017 when Michael visited me. That's one work. And Papa's group had some work recently uh, ver trying to verify the deep uh, reinforced learning. And then Colorado, there's a professor in their CS department has done some work in verify a neural network. So I think, but of course, they all make some assumption of this neural network. For example, only two layers or only use uh, relu act, uh, activator, something like that. But I guess people start to look into this. Um, and the third version is we don't do online verification. We don't do offline rigorous mathemat mathematical pro uh, proof. Uh, let's do the stress testing. So instead of testing every possible scenario in continuous world, it's not possible. But let's test, uh, you know, just like experiment design, let's sample the entire you know feasible space, and let's do a like a Gaussian process fit, and let's find the failure mode, and let's improve the system and test it again. So that's one going effort in my group and uh, Michael Kokenderfer's group as well. So I guess that's the three schools of thoughts to uh, kind of verify or say something about a learned policy. Thank you very much. Thank you.